My name is Mike Ryan. I'm a security consultant with ISEC Partners, and I'm here to talk to you about Bluetooth Smart, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the fix. So before we get into the technical aspects of the talk, why even bother talking about Bluetooth Smart? Why research this? Well, in case you haven't been paying attention, it's showing up everywhere. Here's a small sampling of devices I found on the internet that use Bluetooth Smart. As you can see, lots of devices use Bluetooth Smart. Some of them you probably use every day. Some of them might even surprise you a little bit. And in case you've been living under a rock the last couple of weeks, it's appearing everywhere. But don't let my anecdote convince you. Let's go by the numbers. From a press release by the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, first half of 2013, there was 186% year over year growth in shipping consumer devices. 7 million devices in the first half of the year. This technology has huge market penetration. Another press release note forecasts that Bluetooth Smart will lead market share in wireless medical devices. Wireless medical devices, what could possibly go wrong? I actually, I got, I was a little curious, so I looked up the officially supported device list from the Bluetooth SIG and I found a blood glucose monitor. That makes me a little nervous. So, Bluetooth Smart's here now. It's probably in your pocket. It's big, it's the next big thing in low power consumer wireless. So, it's definitely worth taking a look at. So without further ado, now that we're properly motivated, let's get right into it. The good. Bluetooth smart. And I start with this because it's actually a pretty good protocol for what it is. For low power consumer wireless devices, it does the job. It, it could be a lot worse. So what exactly is Bluetooth smart anyway? This is where it starts to get technical, so buckle up. Bluetooth smart is a new modulation and link layer mode for low power devices. As compared to classic Bluetooth, it's incompatible. Classic Bluetooth devices cannot communicate with Bluetooth smart devices and vice versa. This is because at the phi layer, the physical layer, and the link layer, they're almost completely different. However, higher level protocols were reused. This is both really good from a design perspective and really good from an analysis perspective because we can take advantage of existing tools for studying the protocol. It was introduced in 2010 as a part of the Bluetooth 4.0 4 spec. That's why sometimes you'll hear Bluetooth Smart incorrectly referred to as Bluetooth 4. That's not technically accurate. Bluetooth 4 is just the latest version of the spec. It encompasses all existing Bluetooth technology. Classic Bluetooth, Bluetooth, al Bluetooth alternate Mac 5, and of course Bluetooth Smart. Uh, so Bluetooth Smart is actually a subset of Bluetooth 4. I'll also note that it used to be referred to as Bluetooth Low Energy or BTLE. That's still how I usually refer to it. But for the sake of the talk, I'm going to try to stick to Bluetooth Smart. If you hear me say Bluetooth Low Energy or BTLE, uh, it's all the same thing. So I apologize in advance. This is what the protocol stack looks like. Starting at the bottom, you've got the Phi layer, the link layer, L2 cap, the attribute protocol, and GAT. And I will go into these one by one to just give you a complete breakdown of the protocol. So at the bottom, the Phi layer, when a Bluetooth smart device transmits, what does it look like? I mean, what, what does that even mean? So when a device transmits, a radio chip on the device generates a small amount of modulated RF. The modulation used is GFSK, Gaussian frequency shift keying. This is the same modulation used in classic Bluetooth, but it's used a little bit differently here. They use 250 kilohertz offset and the data rate is one megabit per second. So that's part of why it's incompatible with classic Bluetooth. Uh, but the main reason that it's incompatible with classic Bluetooth is how it breaks up the spectrum into individual channels. Bluetooth Smart takes the 80 megahertz wide, 2.4 gigahertz uh, wireless spectrum, the same spectrum used for 802.11 Wi-Fi and classic Bluetooth, and it breaks it up into 40 channels. Each channel is one megahertz wide, but the center carriers of each channel are spaced 2 megahertz apart. So you'll get a channel, 1 megahertz wide, 1 megahertz of nothing, another channel, so on and so forth. Classic Bluetooth actually breaks up into 80 channels without any gaps. 
During connections, the master and slave hop along these channels according to a predefined hopping pattern. So this hopping pattern is way simpler than classic Bluetooth. So this, these aspects alone make it physically incompatible with classic Bluetooth. The hopping sequence is pretty simple. Of the 40 data channels, 37, or, sorry, of the 40 Bluetooth smart channels, 37 are devoted to data. And the master and the slave each hop along the, all the data channels. When they reach a channel, they each transmit one packet. First the master transmits, then the slave transmits, then they hop to another channel, the master transmits and the slave transmits, so on and so forth. The way you determine the next channel is you take your current channel and you add a value to it called the hop increment. This is a value shared between the master and slave when the connection is set up. The so you take the current channel, add the hop increment and modulo 37. So you'll see the hop, the hop sequence at the bottom of the slide. You start on channel 3, master transmits, slave transmits, they wait a second, hop to the next channel, channel 10, master transmits, slave transmits, so on and so forth. They reach channel 31, you hop down to channel 1 because 31 plus 7 is the, sorry, I didn't mention the hop increment is 7 in this. So 31 plus 7 is 38, mod 37 is 1. Because 37 is prime, every connection will visit all 37 data channels. So it sounds kind of complicated but it's a lot simpler than some other wireless hopping protocols. That's pretty much the file layer in a nutshell. Moving up to the link layer, this is what packets actually look like over the air. There's a, an 8-bit preamble which is just an alternating sequence of zeros and ones. This allows the receiving radio to synchronize to the transmission. Following that is a 32-bit value, four octets, four bytes long. That's called the access address. This value is shared between the master and the slave when they start a connection. The 32-bit access address allows the receiver to identify packets that are a part of the current connection that it's interested in. It helps filter out a lot of false positives and lets the receiver say, okay, there's probably a packet coming right now. After the access address is the PDU, the protocol data unit. That's the actual data that's being transmitted wirelessly by Bluetooth Smart. It has a minimum length of two octets because there's always a two byte header at the beginning. The header includes a logical link ID which helps differentiate between control and data packets and a length field because the PDU is variable length. At the end of the packet is a CRC. It's a little bit different from a typical CRC but in principle it's the same. It allows you to verify whether any bits have been flipped in the data. Right above the link layer is L2 cap. L2 cap is borrowed from older Bluetooth standards. In this case it's pretty much just bloat because uh, you see there's a 16 bit channel ID there. That's used in classic Bluetooth to differentiate which service is actually being used. You've got RF com, and SDP for audio headsets and things like that. The channel ID is how you identify which one is being transmitted. In Bluetooth Smart, there's only one value that's legal for the channel ID. That's the attribute protocol. And there's a redundant length field. So in this case, it's bloat. But for the sake of building a, a Bluetooth chip and for the sake of analyzing stuff, it's not that big a deal. It's only four bytes. And then following that's the actual information payload. So right on top of L2 cap is the attribute protocol and on top of that is GAT. So I've spent a lot of time with my nose in the spec. I can't really tell you where AT ends and GAT begins so I'm going to talk about them at the same time. Give me a second here. So GAT is the protocol that is basically the application layer. This is where we finally get to the point where we exchange meaningful data values that an end user cares about. Everything is defined in terms of services and characteristics. A device has one or more services that run on it and each service is made up by a group of characteristic, uh, characteristics. And each characteristic has simple operations on it such as perhaps it's able to be read or written to or there are other operations that I'll describe in a little bit. Everything here is identified by a UUID, a 128 bit value that's unique to each service and characteristic. In some circumstances you can shorten it to 16 bits but they're always expandable to 128 bits. 
So here's a, an example of a GAT service that's implemented in production devices right now, the heart rate service implemented by heart rate monitors and certain wristbands that have heart rate monitors built in. The service UUID, 16, bit, uh, yeah, 16 bits, 18 OD, and there are two characteristics of interest. The first characteristic, 2A37, is the heart rate. You can't read or write this. You would think you might be able to read it, but uh, actually they just don't, they don't support that. Instead they support notify where you subscribe to updates. When you connect to the device you tell it, hey, let me know anytime there are updates to the heart rate. And the, the slave device, your heart rate sensor, will get back to you periodically with, oh, the heart rate is 60 beats per minute, the heart rate is 62 beats per minute. Pretty decent from a design perspective. The second characteristic is uh, sensor location, 2A38. And this is a readable value. It's just an 8-bit integer that is a standardized list of sensor locations on the body. You've got chest, uh, wrist, earlobe, who knew? And there are a couple other characteristics that are used for bookkeeping. Uh, it's uh, GAD is a self-describing protocol, so it's uh, actually pretty pretty handy. So if you connect to a device and it's a friendly device, it can actually give you a description of every characteristic. So you might connect to a, an unknown device and see a characteristic you can't identify by UUID. Well, if you read another characteristic, it'll tell you this is a temperature or this is humidity. So it's GAD is a pretty cool protocol. So to recap, that's the whole Bluetooth smart stack. Starting at the file layer where you've got uh, simple channels and hopping, moving up to the link layer where you've got a CRC and a PDU and some access address, basically radio stuff for remote devices to be able to pick out signals and the noise. Above that you've got L2 cap which is kind of a waste. And then finally the attribute protocol and GAT which are user data. But I don't know about you guys. It's pretty boring just to hear a rote description of a protocol. I'd much rather look at it as it's flying over the air. I want to sniff it. But sniffing Bluetooth is hard. Mike Osman has been telling us this for many years. Part of the reason is uh, conventional Bluetooth dongles don't have a monitor mode like 802.11 Wi Fi dongles do. You can't just say, give me every packet that's flying through the air so I can analyze it. Instead, you have to build custom hardware. Uh, so, sniffing Bluetooth is hard, but Mike was talking about classic Bluetooth when he made this slide. Luckily, sniffing Bluetooth LE or Bluetooth Smart is a lot simpler. So, I'll tell you how I did that. Pretty simple. You start at the bottom and you work your way up. You start at the file layer and the link layer. These are unique to Bluetooth Smart. And uh, these, this is what you actually need custom hardware to sniff. So, I used an Ubertooth to get at these layers. And finally, after I got the, the link layer packet, I can hand it up to the PC where we've already got tools for dealing with L2 cap, attribute protocol, and GAT. So if you haven't seen it before, this is an Ubertooth. I'm sure it's hard to see from the back. I've got a simple block diagram on the slide. Uh, on the left you've got an RF amplifier connected to an antenna. And that's connected to a CC2400 reconfigurable radio chip. The, they, the amplifier and the radio chip just uh, communicate via RF. We configure the radio chip to use modulation parameters, same as, uh, the same modulation parameters as Bluetooth Smart. That handles the file there for us. That converts the RF, which is just analog signals, into bits. Bits we can deal with. Then connected to the 2400 is an LPC 1750 series ARM microcontroller. That's where we handle the link layer. That converts the bits into packets. And finally, that's connected to the USB on the PC, and that just ships the packets up to the PC for later analysis. So at the file layer, the way we capture packets is we configure the CC2400 to be in GFSK mode, 250 kilohertz offset, uh, 1 megabit per second and we tune it to the proper channel. We know the proper channel because uh, I already told you about the link layer and hopping. The LPC tells us that. We just follow the connections according to the hop pattern. This is depends on two values, the hop increment and the hop interval. Uh, we get these either by witnessing the connect packet or we've got a promiscuous mode that can recover them after the fact. And that's it. That just gives, that gives us bits. And the ARM microcontroller deals with the bits. 
That brings us up to the link layer. But we've got a small problem. Everything in the link layer is defined in terms of octets. But we don't have octets, we have bits. We don't know where one octet, one byte, begins and the next ends. So we have a sea of bits. We want the start of the PDU. We want to know where the octet boundary is more abstractly. However, we do know the access address. Suppose we got it from the connect packet. So what we do is we've got this sea of bits flowing in and we start searching for the 32 bit access address. And when we see it, hey, there's the end of our access address and immediately following that is our PDU. And it's that simple. That's how we go from bits to the PDU boundary and we can deal with the octet data according to the spec. This is actually the old way of doing it. The new way of doing it is we configure the CC2400 to look for that 32 bit access address and just give us data when it sees that. That's a real, that's a big win for us because we don't have to constantly watch a bit stream as it's flowing in and the CC2400 does a lot of fancy stuff to detect that 32 bit value. Way smarter stuff than we can do in the ARM microcontroller. So this brings our packet reception rate up from 60% or so up to like 99%. So that's, that's a major improvement that we've seen in recent weeks. So we've got the file layer. We've got the link layer. These are the parts that are unique to Bluetooth Smart. Now we can pass up the packets to the PC where we've already got tools for dealing with L2 cap, the attribute protocol, and GAT. In fact, Wireshark has dissectors for these protocols. At the top of the list you see BT at, the Bluetooth attribute protocol, and at the bottom we've got L2 cap. I don't want to write parsers for these. I want to let somebody else handle that. So I'll pass them up to Wireshark. So Wireshark speaks PCAP. Ubertooth BTLE, the command line utility that we use to communicate with the Ubertooth, speaks packets. So all we do is we take libpcap and we dump the raw packet data into packets. We slap a PPI header on it the way ng and Kismet do for non-Ethernet packets and that's it. We dump them out. We actually recently just got a DLT for Bluetooth Smart. That's a unique identifier for the protocol. Every protocol that libpcap supports has a DLT. So this means that we can finally make a public release of our Wireshark plugins very soon. We also have one for classic Bluetooth. So pretty soon Wireshark's going to have great support for Bluetooth native, Bluetooth smart and classic Bluetooth sniffed with Ubertooth. Here's a couple of screenshots of it in action. On the left, I'm making a request to a device asking for its device name. It's probably pretty hard to see, but it's that highlighted field at the bottom of the Wireshark breakdown. And on the right, there's the response coming from the device telling us its name. And these packets were sniffed over the air using Ubertooth, using the, the firmware I designed and the Wireshark plugins that I've built. And of course this is all open source but I'll get to that at the end. And a last note before we move on, there is encryption provided by the link layer and it only covers the protocol data unit. You have to have the access address in clear text so the radio can identify the start of the packet and it encrypts it and it also authenticates it using AES CCM there's really not a whole lot to say about this encryption because it's pretty good. AES CCM doesn't have any known weaknesses. Uh, unfortunately, that brings us to the bad. The key exchange. Bluetooth Smart uses a custom key exchange protocol seems like a poor choice given that there are some thoroughly well vetted key exchange protocols that don't have any weaknesses. So it's a three stage process. The first stage you exchange, you uh, there's a temporary key that's used to encrypt a f the few first few messages that go over the wire. In the first stage you calculate a confirm value to make sure that you're using the same temporary key and you've established the same random numbers that are used later in the process. The second and third stages are just exchanging a short term and a long term key. The first stage is where the problem is. The first stage, I the temporary key is determined by the pairing method. There are three pairing methods. Just works. That just sounds like a bad idea. Six digit pin and out of band pairing. Here's a quote from the spec. 
None of the pairing methods provide protection against a passive eavesdropper. Say what? <laughs> That's right. None of the pairing methods provide protection against a passive eavesdropper. The spec does go on to say a future version of this specification will include elliptic curve cryptography, but the current version doesn't. So, they knew it was broken when they released it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate how broken it is. So that uh, when the devices begin pairing, they exchange a few values over the air in plain text. These values are highlighted in green here that confirm a random value that has randomness from both devices, P1 and P2, which are pretty unimportant. We have these. If we sit by passively intercepting packets, we can collect all of this information. The only thing we don't have is the TK, the temporary key. We know something about the temporary key. If you're using just works or a uh, six digit pin, is an integer between zero and 999999. And if you're using just works, it's always zero. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's vulnerable to a simple brute force. You just try all, all one million values and eventually you will crack the key. Anyone want to hazard a guess how long it takes to crack? Less than a second. <laughs> There's your Bluetooth smart key exchange. That's it. When you have the temporary key, you can recover the short term key. Using the short term key, you can decrypt the communications used to exchange the long term key. And finally, the long term key is used during every connection to encrypt session keys. Your key exchange is broken right from the start. And this is 100% passive attack. You, have, you cannot know that this is occurring. The only way you can tell you're getting hacked is if you sit around at the coffee shop, you look around and you see this guy. <laughs> and that rolls us right into the ugly. The long term key reuse. Now at face value, this sounds like a good idea. If you pair in a Faraday cage, nobody can possibly observe your uh, you observe your key exchange. And before you laugh, I have paired in a Faraday cage. However, there's a mitigation for this. Oh, sorry. I forgot to mention. So every time that you, after you've paired, every time you want to establish an encrypted session, all you do is use a pre-established long-term key. The master tells the slave, hey, let's encrypt this using that long-term key we already exchanged. So if an attacker doesn't witness the long-term key exchange, he can't decrypt the connection. That's part of what makes AES CCM pretty good. But we do have a mitigation for that. There's a simple active attack that we can do to force the master and slave to repair. It really is simple. You just need to know the MAC address of the slave device. Uh, a funny feature of Bluetooth smart chips is that every chip can be used as a master or a slave. So random device here can act as a master, my laptop can act as a slave. So what you do is you change the MAC address of your Bluetooth adapter on your laptop to match that of your slave. You start a GAT server on your laptop, Blues on Linux handily has one, and when the master goes to pair, you just make sure your laptop is louder than the device you wish to uh, de-pair from the master. The master says, hey, let's use that long-term key you already established. The, your laptop says, yo, I don't know anything about that key, totally according to protocol, and the master says, okay, let's reestablish a key. At that point, you just turn off Bluetooth on your laptop, Master gets a little bit confused, reconnects to the slave and says, hey, let's reestablish a connection. The slave goes, sure, whatever. And then you passively can intercept the communications again. So, uh, in either situation, either you already know the long term key or you can force the master and slave to repair, you will have the long term key. Every single connection used after that, the master can decrypt. It's a very simple procedure. The attacker just passively listens to the packets that you exchange. He waits for you to establish a connection. The first thing you're going to do is start encryption and then the attacker passively listening to your connection collects this information and has every piece of information he needs to decrypt your connection. 
every subsequent connection you make. Not only is it theoretically possible, it's practically possible. My tool, Crackle, will do that as well. If you give it a PCAP file that has the entire pairing set up, it will crack the TK, output the long term key, and decrypt the rest of the PCAP file. If you give it a PCAP file and you provide it with a long term key, so one that you've already observed in the past, it will decrypt that as well. So, to recap, the key exchange is broken, and because they reuse the long term key, all future communication is effectively compromised. And this is 99% passive. In the worst case scenario, you do one active attack with completely off the shelf hardware that most of you probably already have. All is not lost. There is a simple fix to this problem. Secure simple pairing. Before I get into that, secure simple pairing is the pairing mechanism used in classic Bluetooth. I'm really not sure why they didn't just define it for Bluetooth Smart. Possibly because it's computationally intensive, but it doesn't matter. You only have to pair once and you can securely establish a key that's reused many, many times. A word about my qualifications. I'm an InfoSec researcher. I'm an InfoSec consultant with ISEC Partners. ISEC Partners is an information security consulting firm that specializes in web and mobile application tes pen testing. I'm an occasional programmer, a husband, and I can grill a mean steak. I'm not a cryptographer. That's why I suggested using secure simple pairing. If you're not a cryptographer, don't build a crypto system. I'm going to repeat that. If you get nothing from this talk, remember this. If you're not a cryptographer, don't build a crypto system. You will get it wrong and people will laugh at you at Black Hat next year when they break your device. So that's part of the reason I chose Secure Simple Pairing. It's already a thoroughly well vetted crypto system. It's been in production since Bluetooth 2.1, that's 2007, and there's only one known weakness. And that weakness we can just work around. My mom likes to call it the worst times. So there is passive eavesdropping protection through the use of elliptic curve Diffie Hellman. The downside of that is that ECDH is pretty expensive. Uh, secure simple pairing is uh, defined around the NIST curve SecP 192R1. That means you've got to do 192 bit multiplies, a couple of them. It's pretty slow. It takes about five seconds on an 8 bit CPU. And up until recently, there was no open source implementation for 8 bit CPUs, that is. So there's five stages to SSP. The first stage, public key exchange, the master and slave just exchange their public key points. The second stage, authentication, the master and slave actually do the ECDH calculation to verify that they are both using the same, there, there is, has not been a man in the middle attacker. The third stage, authentication, is used to calculate and confirm that allows them to verify that they're using the same random numbers. Link key calculation for determining a link key and finally, authentication and encryption. So the last stage is not relevant to us because we've already got our own encryption built into Bluetooth Smart. And in the second phase, that's where they define pairing. The one vulnerability in Bluetooth uh, in SSP is that if you use pin entry, it's vulnerable to having your pin being completely leaked. <clears throat> so modern Bluetooth devices don't support it. We don't support it either. We only want to use the numeric comparison mode. And it's backward compatible. The, sp the spec actually incorrectly notes that none of the pairing mechanisms in Bluetooth Smart provide uh, passive eavesdropping protection. That's not actually too true. Out of band pairing is not broken. One, it, I'll actually note that if you, if you can actually exchange a 128 bit value out of band, you should do that because it's a lot simpler than implementing SSP. However, if you can't do that, you will use the calculated link key from step four as 128 bits of out of band data. And most chips actually have support for this. It's part of the spec. You tell the chip, hey, use this 128 bit value for out of band pairing. The master and the slave both have the same 128 bit value because they both went through SSP together. And then you go through pairing as usual. You get the full benefits of Bluetooth smart encryption, including having GAT support for 
characteristics that can be read are only read when they're encrypted and you get the benefits of SSP with eavesdropping protection. So uh, I'll do a couple demos right now. Let's see what we got here. So I'm using a development version of Wireshark that has XCAP support. Uh, this is something that Dragorn, Mike Kershaw and I were working on. So you can actually see the Bluetooth, Ubertooth devices in Wireshark here and I can configure it to be on this particular channel. So I'm going to fire up Wireshark listening on my two Ubertooth. Hmm. Somebody's out there. Bluetooth smart capable smartphone. I'm currently wearing a heart rate monitor. Let me filter these. Oh, I'll filter those in a second. And I'm going to go ahead and fire up the heart rate monitor application on my phone. We've got a connection. And this data is being written from my phone, captured over the air using Ubertooth, and being displayed on the PC here. This is a handle value notification from the heart rate service. Uh, let me fire up XMAG so you can actually see it. That 70 right there, that's my heart rate. From my smartphone to a heart rate monitor via Ubertooth. So as you can see, we have a very rich, very capable sniffing platform. I will try one other thing now. Uh, I'll show you the encryption. I'll restart Wireshark here. So uh, before we transition, that was my first demo. You, we can sniff passively uh, connections between Bluetooth smart devices. And uh, as you'll note, my smartphone does not use encryption when it talks to my heart rate monitor. Anyone close enough can recover that data. Moving on to the second demo. Start capturing again. Uh, this time I'm going to connect to the heart rate monitor from my laptop so I can actually show you the encryption setup. So uh, these packets over here are the actual packets going by. In the bottom right, I'm connecting to it using a, a blues tool. So I'll connect. This, this is the part where it doesn't work because I'm on stage. I'll give it a couple tries. Mm -hmm. I thought this might happen. So I brought a rubber chicken. Oh, demo gods, be good to me. Nope. All right, I'll give it a couple more tries. No. Okay. Well, that doesn't appear to be working. That's okay. I actually did collect a sample uh, or a little bit earlier when I wasn't standing on stage with a whole bunch of wireless noise. Here is some, oops. Here is a, come on, where is it? Here it is. So, okay, well, it's not displaying properly in Wireshark, but I have a complete pairing set up in this PCAP file. Uh, it's just the Bluetooth smart pairing where the master and the slave exchange the temporary key, the long term key, the short term key, and the long term key. And, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, decrypt this for you guys. I've included a time output. Temporary key found, zero, 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 zero. And here is the long term key that's used to encrypt this communication and all future communication between the master, my laptop, and the slave, the heart monitor that I'm wearing right now. And actually, if we fire this one up, this should actually potentially <laughs> work. Oh, that's the wrong version of Wireshark. Don't have too many versions of Wireshark installed, kids. Why is it not showing up? There we go. So you can see the data in here. 
and oh yeah, there was nothing actually in that. Well, anyway, the temporary key cracked, and that was actually a worst case scenario. I ran the brute force algorithm in reverse. It took 1.5 seconds because I'm on battery and my laptop's not running at full speed. That concludes the demo portion of the talk. The question that you all should be asking right now, am I affected by this vulnerability? The short answer is probably. This is a protocol error. I didn't mention any vendor names because they're all vulnerable. Any Bluetooth smart device that implements encryption and key exchange according to the spec is vulnerable to this issue. There is one exception. I found that some vendors implemented their own security layer on top of GAT. Remember what I said earlier. If you're not a cryptographer, don't build a crypto system. I know there was a major weakness in one of these that I've identified but I don't have permission to talk about right now. So really if you want to improve your security, use out of band pairing if you can. If you can't, use SSP. So to summarize, Bluetooth Smart is pretty good. Its key exchange is broken and the reuse of the long term key fundamentally damns the security of the protocol. However, if you implement a simple fix using SSP, you will be invulnerable to this type of problem. And I'll wrap up with a discussion of some of the capabilities that I've developed as a part of this project. On the Ubertooth, we can passively intercept Bluetooth Smart as I demonstrated up here on stage. We also support promiscuous mode and injection. I didn't discuss those but I can go into them if anyone's interested, uh, offline probably. I developed some Wireshark plugins for dealing with the Bluetooth smart link layer and I developed a tool called Crackle. Crackle will crack the temporary key that you sniffed with Ubertooth and it will decrypt any PCAP file if you submit it, if, if you provide it with a long term key. Finally, I released a piece of software called Nano ECC. This is an 8 bit implementation of elliptic curve Diffie Hellman. It will run on 8 bit processors. It's pretty, it's not super well optimized but it's pretty speedy. It will take about 5 seconds to do a ECDH calculation. I plan to have a demo version of the whole SSP running on this little Bluetooth smart dev board but uh, it died. A cautionary tale of the dangers of doing 192 bit multiplies on an 8 bit microprocessor. So here's some links to some of the software. Uh, if you're interested, come talk to me later. But Ubertooth and LibBTBB, Nano ECC is up on ISEC's GitHub, and Crackle is up on my personal website. I'd like to wish a very special happy birthday to my wife who's sitting here in the audience. And that's it. I want to provide special thanks to Mike Osman and Dominic Spill who are here, not in this room, but they're super awesome because they built and support the Ubertooth project. Also, I'd like to give thanks to Mike Kershaw, uh, the rest of the Ubertooth team. Blues on Linux, which is some of the finest Bluetooth smart support available right now, and the Bluetooth special interest group for publishing a really readable spec. Last but not least, I'd like to thank Black Hat for allowing me to speak here and ISEC Partners, my employer, for funding a portion of this research. And that's me. Thank you very much. Also, please scan your badge when you leave the room. So uh, with that, are there any questions? Up here. The question is, can you do SSP on Android or iOS? Uh, the answer is you, this is implemented at the application layer on top of GAT. So you would have to implement it in your application for support. There's no actual Bluetooth device picker for Bluetooth smart the way there is with classic Bluetooth because communicating with the device is so device specific. So it would be a feature you build into your app. I plan to do, I do plan to release uh, Java and iOS version so people can build that into their apps. Question up here. So the question was, uh, was the flaw due to laziness or due to compliance or really why, why did they, uh, why did they have this flaw in the protocol? I think the real reason is because ECDH is expensive to implement. A lot of people probably wouldn't want to implement it and there are some questionable patents involved there. Um, I've heard some inside scoop that it was mainly due to resource constraints. 
Sorry, which slides? Oh, links, sure. Yeah. So the question was how does this work with audio? Can you intercept or inject audio if you're uh, transmitting audio over Bluetooth? Bluetooth Smart does not have any audio capabilities. If you're using audio, you're using classic Bluetooth. Are there other questions? Anyone? Bueller. Okay, thank you very much for sticking it out with me. I'm Mike Ryan from ISEC Partners. Channels, when they reach a channel, they each transmit one packet. First the master transmits, then the slave transmits, then they hop to another channel, the master transmits, and the slave transmits, so on and so forth. The way you determine the next channel is you take your current channel and you add a value to it called the hop increment. This is a value shared between the master and slave when the connection is set up. The so you take the current channel, add the hop increment, and modulo 37. So you'll see the hop, the hop sequence at the bottom of the slide. You start on channel 3, master transmits, slave transmits, they wait a second, hop to the next channel, channel 10, master transmits, slave transmits, so on and so forth. They reach channel 31, you hop down to channel 1 because 31 plus 7 is the, sorry, I didn't mention the hop increment is 7 in this. So 31 plus 7 is 38, mod 37 is 1. Because 37 is prime, every connection will visit all 37 data channels. So it sounds kind of complicated but it's a lot simpler than some other wireless hopping protocols. That's pretty much the file layer in a nutshell. Moving up to the link layer, this is what packets actually look like over the air. There's a, an 8-bit preamble which is just an alternating sequence of zeros and same modulation used in classic Bluetooth but it's used a little bit differently here. They use 250 kilohertz offset and the data rate is 1 megabit per second. So that's part of why it's incompatible with classic Bluetooth. Uh, but the main reason that it's incompatible with classic Bluetooth is how it breaks up the spectrum into individual channels. Bluetooth Smart takes the 80 megahertz wide 2.4 gigahertz uh, wireless spectrum, the same spectrum used for 802.11 Wi-Fi and classic Bluetooth and it breaks it up into 40 channels. Each channel is 1 megahertz wide but the center carriers of each channel are spaced 2 megahertz apart. So you'll get a channel 1 megahertz wide, 1 megahertz of nothing, another channel, so on and so forth. Classic Bluetooth actually breaks it up into 80 channels without any gaps. During connections, the master and slave hop along these channels according to a predefined hopping pattern. So this hopping pattern is way simpler than classic Bluetooth. So this, these aspects alone make it physically incompatible with classic Bluetooth. The hopping sequence is pretty simple. Of the 40 data channels, 37, or sorry, of the 40 Bluetooth smart channels, 37 are devoted to data. And the master and the slave each hop along the, all the data devices. What could possibly go wrong? Actually I got, I was a little curious so I looked up the officially supported device list from the Bluetooth SIG and I found a blood glucose monitor. That makes me a little nervous. So Bluetooth Smart's here now. It's probably in your pocket. It's big. It's the next big thing in low power consumer wireless. So it's definitely worth taking a look at. So without further ado, now that we're properly motivated, let's get right into it. The good. Bluetooth Smart. And I start with this because it's actually a pretty good protocol for what it is. For low power consumer wireless devices, it does the job. It, it could be a lot worse. So what exactly is Bluetooth Smart anyway? This is where it starts to get technical so buckle up. Bluetooth Smart is a new modulation and link layer mode for low power devices. As compared to classic Bluetooth, it's incompatible. Classic Bluetooth devices cannot communicate with Bluetooth smart devices and vice versa. This is because at the phi layer, the physical layer, and the link layer, they're almost completely different. However, higher level protocols were reused. This is both really good from a design perspective and really good from an analysis perspective because we can take advantage of it. My name is Mike Ryan. I'm a security consultant with ISEC Partners and I'm here to talk to you about Bluetooth Smart. The good, the bad, 
the ugly, and the fix. So before we get into the technical aspects of the talk, why even bother talking about Bluetooth Smart? Why research this? Well, in case you haven't been paying attention, it's showing up everywhere. Here's a small sampling of devices I found on the internet that use Bluetooth Smart. As you can see, lots of devices use Bluetooth Smart. Some of them you probably use every day. Some of them might even surprise you a little bit. And in case you've been living under a rock the last couple of weeks, it's appearing everywhere. But don't let my anecdote convince you. Let's go by the numbers. From a press release by the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, first half of 2013, there was 186% year over year growth in shipping consumer devices. 7 million devices in the first half of the year. This technology has huge market penetration. Another press release note forecasts that Bluetooth Smart will lead market share in wireless medical devices. Wireless medical existing tools for studying the protocol. It was introduced in 2010 as a part of the Bluetooth 4.0 4 spec. That's why sometimes you'll hear Bluetooth Smart incorrectly referred to as Bluetooth 4. That's not technically accurate. Bluetooth 4 is just the latest version of the spec. It encompasses all existing Bluetooth technology. Classic Bluetooth, Bluetooth, al Bluetooth alternate Mac 5 and of course Bluetooth Smart. Uh, so Bluetooth Smart is actually a subset of Bluetooth 4. I'll also note that it used to be referred to as Bluetooth Low Energy or BTLE. That's still how I usually refer to it. But for the sake of the talk, I'm going to try to stick to Bluetooth Smart. If you hear me say Bluetooth Low Energy or BTLE, uh, it's all the same thing. So I apologize in advance. This is what the protocol stack looks like. Starting at the bottom, you've got the phi layer, the link layer, L2 cap, the attribute protocol, and GAT. And I will go into these one by one to just give you a complete breakdown of the protocol. So at the bottom, the phi layer, when a Bluetooth smart device transmits, what does it look like? I mean, what, what does that even mean? So when a device transmits, a radio chip on the device generates a small amount of modulated RF. The modulation used is GFSK, Gaussian frequency shift keying. This is the